And this is Thursday morning, uh, May the 25th. Uh, this is Lancaster Woodturner's Weekly Coffee Hour, number 153, since uh, April of 2020, when we began doing this, or March of 2020. Uh, my name is John Kelsey. I'll be your host this week, as usual. I see uh, right now 2032 on screen. There's going to be a few more click in. Um, let me see. I, want, I have a bunch of announcements I'd like to make before we get rolling. Um, we do use raise hand here. And if you do want to show stuff, uh, click the find the raise hand on the reactions tab and <coughs> click it. I would dearly love to hear from people who haven't shown us stuff lately. Or I, I love you guys who are always regulars. I can't count on you. But there's also people out here on screen. I'm sure you're making stuff in the shop. You just haven't shown it to us lately. So I'd like to suck it up and do that. That'd be great. Uh, for announcements, uh, as you probably know, the AAW Symposium is the week is not this weekend, but the next weekend, June two, three, four, uh, and they recently put out a discount ticket offer where if you got a group of ten together, you could get forty off, or a group of five could get twenty twenty off from a hundred dollars, which is the uh, regular full boat price to attend the virtual thing. They're going to have two rooms. Uh, with the, that are equipped with video. So there'll be 20, I think 20 demos available on the virtual feed. Um, it's a pretty wide range of things. I, I, when I first looked at it, I didn't think I would be interested in much of it, but I found something in each time slot that does interest me. So um, I signed up early at full price. And then we started offering the group deal to this group and other clubs. And we sold out two groups of 10. So that's 20 who got 40 off in our groups. And you know who you are. You've still a lot of you are on screen. We got one group of five hanging out there, and, and if, I'm going to close that group out tonight. Uh, if only one more wants to join it, tough luck, that's not going to work. But if you get five more, we'll get that whole group up to a group of 10 for 40 off. So if you've been on the fence about doing the AAW Symposium and you'd like to get in on the discount deal, today's your day. I have to close it at the end of today. The uh, deadline for the discount tickets is May 31st. I need time to collect, uh, collect the PayPals, and some guys are mailing me checks. So... Uh, that has to happen since this is this is not being done through the club bank account. It's done being done through my own hook. So um, I'm not buying any discount passes until people pony up. Uh, once you do that, and once we buy the discount ticket, which we've done for the two groups of ten, uh, AAW says they'll send the link out to me the day be two day or two forty eight hours before the start of the event, and I'll then pass it on on, on to you guys. I'm really hoping that goes off without a hitch because I really don't want to be everybody's uh, troubleshooter on it. But since I'm on the dime, I'm uh, willing to, you know, do what I can to make sure it all works smoothly. Um, and I'm just hoping that their, their registration was eh, not too well thought out. So I'm kind of hoping that the actual uh, passing out of the discount uh, codes and all of that is uh, going to be a little better worked out and it all goes off without a hitch. Um, so if anybody wants in on the discount deal, today's the day. Give me a give me a text, give me a phone call, give me an email. You've got my you've all got my email because I send you notices every week. Uh, the other announcements, let me just get my calendar up so I'm sure of the dates. This is really early June is a heavy time for especially for a Lancaster club. After the AAW thing on the sixth, we're gonna have Angelo doing a club demo. Um I'm gonna have to spotlight me to get to, to seize the hour here. So I'm just gonna do that real quick. Okay, um, Angelo's going to show us the finer points of making these things. Now, this is one I made, and it is not anywhere near as elegant or good as Angelo, but it does show you the principle. It's a magician's trick. You open the vase, and there's the ball, and you dump the ball out, and there's the empty vase. Now we put the vase back together, and we say the magic word, and we take the lid off again, and there's the ball back again. So that's the magic trick, and there's an awful lot of intricate and detailed wood turning stuff that goes on in that that um, Angelo is going to show us so um, if you're a Lancaster club member or if you want to be a guest that's next Tuesday the 6th and then I think the following Saturday the 10th is Lancaster open shop is that right Barry is it the 10th for the next open shop yeah yeah, yeah. the uh, 10th at uh, 9 to 12 9 to 12 at Kaufman Kitchen so First week of June is a is a fully booked week of June for, for guys around here, anyhow. Anybody with other announcements? Randy, what's up with Susquehanna? Is Randy on here? I don't even see him. Huh. I guess we don't uh, know John, about Susquehanna. John, I, uh, to add to your uh, online registration thing, uh, for those who aren't aware, I think it's uh, that they have 30 days of uh, viewability after the symposium. They can watch those any of those 20 uh, artists 
for 30 yeah. days after the symposium. That's true. And they're also planning to try and fill up some of the spaces in between uh, the uh, events, the, the demos with uh, interviews, and they're going to visit the galleries and exhibitions, and they're going to visit the trade show. Uh, after our experiments last year at Mid-Atlantic, that is a little more difficult than one imagines going in, but uh, maybe they've done enough practice to pull it off. The key problem, of course, is maintaining a good, strong Wi-Fi signal no matter what. That's pretty hard. Uh, but if you can establish that or get a wire to the main computer, it'll work pretty good. Uh, I'm seeing this. All kinds of people are showing up here on the virtual screen. So I'm going to just... Uh, no, I'm not going to spotlight me. I'm going to spotlight you guys. Um, raise your hands if you've got something you want to show us today. I'm going to start going going down the list in just a second here. Okay. Um, Mr. Don, what do you have today? Don Smith. Don is coming at us from Portsmouth, England. Right. Good morning to you all. Um, I showed at, right at the beginning a couple of things I've made from the jig that what was his name? Jim Duxbury? Duxbury, yeah. Yeah, Jim Duxbury showed a jig a couple of weeks ago, and I made one. I took it to our Saturday club, and these are a couple of things I've made on that jig. Off center turning. And another one. Hold that up again. Hold that up again. Hold that up again. Bring that back if you wouldn't mind. How many centers did you use on that? Hold it still, right there. How many one, how many different centers one, are on two, there? Three, four centers on that one. So the jig is a little dewy that lets you just move the uh, workpiece a little bit off axis and make another circle. That's right. You 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 yeah. put have it on center for the first ring, and yeah. then I moved it a quarter of an inch, the jig whole jig out a quarter of an inch. And then I turned it round on the different degrees that I've marked on the jig and turned it round so that you got the different pieces. This now, was do, you do, that, do you do that directly on, say, the lid of a box, or do you make that and do it as an inlay in the box? I make this separate because if you were to do it and you mess it up, you can mess up the whole of the box. So I make these and then I put them insert into the lid. Okay. So that you don't get it. But this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight on this one. Can you see that? Yeah. And then now, what, what happens if you go way off, way off axis with that? How does it work? Well, then you come off and you go around uh, with a, a radius on it instead of a full circle. Right. And then using the same jig, I made uh, using the mini texturing tool. Hold still. So what you use the texturing on the orange band. Oh, I see on the green is used the same jig as well. They're all the same jig used at different angles. Have I got, I've got one here. Let's have a look. I think it's this one. Yeah. Now, this one, the you have a little flower in the center, and then the next ring is with the same tool, but probably five degrees turn on it. And then the next one is more open. The third one, which is the uh, mauve one, goes one way. And then keeping the, in your mind, the diet, the angle that you've used it, you turn it over completely. So the cut it and come back. So you've got, if you like, like a herringbone between two, two rings. And then the outside is done with the same tool uh, sorry, you change your cutter and you use the texturing tool, not the spiraling tool, and you indent it like orange peel all the way around the outside. That's a very nice group of effects there. That's a really good little demo piece. Yeah, they look nice when you put them on top of boxes. 
because you can dome them as well. These are not dome, these are just for demonstration purposes, but you can dome them as well and do it that way. I mean, I've got so many here. Um, you got the jig there. Let's uh, show the jig for those who might not remember it or weren't here. I'll uh, pick it up and I'll bring it back and show you at the end, John. It's in the uh, workshop. And that's the last one where I made hold, a mistake. Hold still. I got a hole right in the middle. <laughs> Did you plug it? No, no, I haven't plugged it. I just show <laughs> people that you can make mistakes. Hence why I, I make them separate to the box lids. <laughs> Otherwise, you got to throw the whole thing away. Oh, you so, just put a diamond in it. Just put pardon? a diamond in it. So. Put a diamond. <laughs> yeah, or, or a rhinestone. Hey, hey, Don, that technique of cutting into air and then into wood, where only part of the cutting cycle is, that's something that's commonly done with ornamental turning. I think it could yield some really neat effects for you. Yes. Uh, especially if you indexed around, yeah. you know, and did it, you know, I say every at 30 degrees or something right that's right yeah um i'm actually making a new jig at the moment um i like the one that uh, jim showed us but i'm making one that i think gives me something like 444 combinations of uh, turning when i've made it i'll show you we can hardly wait so here's duxbury himself we're talking about your jig duxbury that uh, don has been using to make some really nice medallions Show oh, us wow. that one with the hearing bone again, would you? I'd like Duxbury to see it. Yeah. Oh, I got something to show him too. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, wait a minute. He disappeared. We're to show you something, and now you've gone off screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't take it personal, Don. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. You're back. What are you got? Morning, Jim. How are you doing, Dad? Fine. This is the piece I was showing. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Oh, the thing's really gone over. I, I did an article for Wood Turning Magazine. It'll be out. Uh, I don't know. They haven't proved it yet, but uh, it, that thing's caught on. I've got all kinds of emails on that, and uh, it's kind of neat because it's intuitive. I don't have it here. Yeah. Uh, the other one was with using your jig. Yeah. How neat. Well, I'm, I'm making all kinds of things. Um, here's a here's a three uh, three center box. Beautiful. Um, with the lid. The lid for it. Yeah. Is that yeah. you know that same little jig, the one that looked like a camera? Yeah. That uh, damn that thing does all kind of things. Uh. Hold it still. Quit waving it around. Oh. Okay. Have you got the jig there? No, it's out in the shop. <laughs> yeah, that's what you both think. Everybody, the you jig is about what we're interested in. We don't want to see your dumb work. We want to see the jig. Hey, man. Yeah, you guys need the dumb work. You guys need the dumb work. Here's a here's a three sided bottle dapper. Instead instead of a mandrel with a flat end that you use two sided tape. I put a, I drilled it and put a, uh, what is it, a 3 8, 8, 3 8 16 thread in there for the bottle topper. And so I could screw a bottle topper blank on there and turn it into different things. And then uh, the latest one is, I got a bowl too. Th this is, this so is, a five, this is a five center bud vase that's got a vial in it. You're making camshafts. Uh, yeah. The, so, this, Don, you got the jig there. Hold the jig up. I got a spotlight on you both. Okay, so that's the jig. Okay, instead oh, of having a tenon like that, yeah, you got a tenon instead. Instead of having a tenon like that, where you got a tenon with a mandrel, and you're going to turn that piece, right? Yeah. And the, the piece on the the piece that I'm holding is actually the piece that I was going to turn next. It's already stuck onto the uh, mandrel. Okay, well, we're not getting the jig yet. Let me show the. I, we, I really want to understand and show people how this jig works. You got to hold it still and hold it I mean, where we can see it. There we are. Okay. Now, yeah, there, there you go. Now, 
you fit the workpiece in there, and then you tighten the check jaws on it, and you can move it from side to side in the check jaws. Is that how this goes? Yeah. That can go like that in the check jaws. Correct, right, Jim? Okay. Yeah, that's right. And it, it's intuitive how it happens. On, on the other kind, you have a rotating cam. It's rotating around a pivot, like the sorby thing. You know, that yeah. sorby check almost talks. But you have three books of instructions come with it and a DVD. And if you don't know where we have the... Go ahead. He keeps holding it where we can't see it. I want to see what he's doing here. Okay. Let me run out and get mine. I'll run out and get mine. I have to show him this first. He showed this. He showed this. Uh, Diane, you showed this thing. Yes. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the advanced model, okay? <laughs> yeah, it is indeed. <laughs> They're great fun gym to make, aren't they? It, it took me half a day to string this damn thing, okay? <laughs> Doug, we're going to have to call this the Ducks and Don Show. I think this well, is you, just great. You guys are amazing, you two guys. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I had to show that. I'm going to get to call it Donald Ducks. Do something else. I'll do that. It's the children's faces when they see it and they don't know how it works. <laughs> well, you don't have to be a child to figure out that you don't know how it works. <laughs> well, I still oh, I'm only really, only way I'm going to understand that jig is if I make one and try it. When I hear you guys talk about it and then look at it, it's <laughs> something I'm not quite getting. And I'm usually pretty good with geometry, so I don't know. I guess I just have to set up and try it. And like all the things we talk about here, you know, you don't really get it until you go down in the shop and experiment. It's all to do with the uh strings that go through the center of the center block yeah all i've seen drawings for that thing yeah yeah <laughs> okay i'm going to move on this has been great you guys are fantastic and i'm delighted to to have you here every week um toby what do you have today oh i have a few pieces that i've done since last time share a screen here Seeing that? Yep. And this is, uh, oh, I've had a, a pile of maple I've been working, maple burl I've been working on. So this is a one piece. This is five by six and a half inches, different views. Why do you think the way, when you dye it, that the, it picks up the figure and makes it shimmer so beautifully? What What is going on in the wood? Uh, I guess it's the different densities of the wood. You know, the lower density absorbs the dye more, and the the more dense wood doesn't. So it's kind of increases the contrast. Yeah, I really like these streaks that go down through there Toby, that don't pick up the dye. Toby, you're doing something special. You're not telling us. I could not. <laughs> I cannot repeat what you get. It's just so beautiful that you do. And I tried, it just gets all messed. So well, well a lot has a lot has to do with the wood itself. Okay. And how dilute your dye is too. I think the mistake I've always made is I want to see more color. And so I make the dye stronger and it overpowers it. And that's yeah. not the way to go. That I could think, be part of it. I think you're right, because as you might guess, I like I I overdo it. Yep. Yeah. This one is uh, six inches by one and a half inches. Now, your finish is lacquer from the rattle can. Is that right? Uh, it's not actually lacquer. It's the uh, cryon thick coating. I guess it's some kind of a, acrylic. Okay. But it, 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 it pretty much does the same thing as lacquer, and I buff it up afterwards. It doesn't smell as bad, and uh, you can use it with it has a wider range of temperature and humidity. It doesn't affect it like like lacquer gets affected. I actually like the smell of lacquer, <laughs> but I overdid it when I was a kid. I was a silk screen printer, and I smelled way too much of the solvents. So, and not not nothing recreational about it. Just pure. Uh, just getting the work done, and I, I don't, I don't like them actually. But it is a pleasant smell, but too much of it just makes me ill fast. Uh -huh. This one's five by five inches. This one, this, 
I bring got the wrong angle here. You know, bring that the first one back if you wouldn't mind. There, that one. I just find the way that die picks up variably there to be so attractive. It does bring out all the detail that is there, but you don't see it as much in a natural you color. You don't do anything to treat that edge to keep the die out of it or anything. You just paint the die on really carefully, right? So it doesn't go over the edge. Correct. Yeah. Do you seal the edge first? No, I don't seal any of it until, I, until I'm done dying and then I spray it. There's there's the side view. No need. And those are the transient dyes that Jeff Jew, Jewett developed that he sells. Right. Yeah. Now this is this one I showed a couple of weeks ago that was going to be an urn, which it's still going to be. These are the before pictures, and this is the after picture. You can see the same thing that, that one and that one. That one I kind of prefer before. That yeah, yeah. I like before. Yeah. I like that better. That's again, it's all taste, isn't it? It is. And they saw uh one that I had done earlier. This is the, the couple that are buying the piece. And uh they like the colors and the shape that I did the one earlier, but it was smaller, so I made a bigger one similar colors Toby how about the lid not being dyed the lid, lid not died. don't dye the lid just dye the bowl but don't dye the lid what would that uh, okay. I wouldn't like it. <laughs> but then again it's now I like this. when I see this view I like this bet I, I I like the variation you got in there that's really two two different dyes isn't it Yes, this blue down on the bottom, and this spalting line goes, you know, the whole way around the thing. And uh, the spalting actually absorbs the dye and stops it from spreading. So I don't have to get real close to this. All you have to do is get near it, and it'll bleed over a little bit and just stop right in that black line. Beautiful work. How do you fix the lids on your urns? Are they uh, solid or just lift off? This is just a lift off, and and they're, when they when they use it, uh, I told them to just CA glue around the whole, the lip of it. Yeah. And it sits down inside on this rim. And the diameter on that's what, 12 inches? No, no, this is uh, four by five and a half. And what they did, they're divorced, so they split up the mains. So it doesn't have to be as big. It's this is what this is the app. size they requested. So yeah. This one's going to Arizona, actually. Beautiful. Thank you. And I believe that's the last of it. Yep. Okay, Toby, hey, Toby how's your new your new retail venture going? Oh, we're doing well. Uh we're we've been open a month and we've sold uh over nine thousand dollars worth of stuff. So now I think I'm at uh my sales are right around $450, I think. And where's the store? In Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Lewisburg, PA. That's up near State College or near Harrisburg? Where is that? Uh, it's about an hour and 10 minutes from Harrisburg. Yeah. Up past uh, Sunbury. Bucknell. Yeah, Bucknell's in the town. Just, Somebody are you else? Down, are you downtown? You're yeah, past right, the college. Yeah, right in town, right near the square. Okay. Somebody There's else has a question of... that I stopped. Who's that? Hey, Toby, I, I saw Emilio Archival talk about how much humidity changes between Hawaii and everything else, you know, causes problems with stuff when they take things away. Are you, how do you handle shipping stuff to Arizona where it's so dry, where in Pennsylvania it's not? I don't think as far as bowls and stuff, it, it's going to matter. It's mostly when you have joints and pieces of wood fitting together, they're going to shrink differently. A bowl is going to shrink the same amount, whether it's, you know, 10% humidity or or 60% humidity. It's just going to, it's all going to change the same. But if you have different pieces fitting together, then that, that's where you run into problems. A piece of furniture or something like that. Or, or, uh, a glued up, uh, what do you call them, a segmented thing as well? Possibly. I'm not really sure about that. 
stars for sure. Yeah, segmenting doesn't ship well. Oh. Well, I don't yeah. do segmenting, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I don't ship either. So. <laughs> Toby, you, don't need to, you don't need to do segmenting. You got all those burls. I swear. Do you have a burl network somewhere that you get all these burls from? Uh, yeah, I have a giant magnet in the yard and they just kind of show up. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a box of uh, green ones there too for them when they show up? A green paper? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, this, I get my cheap the wood really cheap, sometimes free. That maple that I that I've been making these pieces out of, uh, I got locally here from someone. Uh, and it's actually got a truckload, a pickup truckload. It was all burl, and I actually paid for that, but uh, it's two hundred fifty dollars. So that was fairly cheap. Yeah. I made two pieces and paid for it. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for Toby? Thank you again, Toby. That's beautiful work. Um, I'm going to skip over to Ray here. I haven't heard from Ray in a while. What do you have today, Ray? I think you're muted. Okay, how's that? Good. How's that? Yeah. You can hear that? Yes. Okay. Um, we were, we were talking about scrapers and, and John Jordan a little bit earlier. And um, I don't know if this is something that... Uh, you guys have seen that John to come from John Jordan, and um, let me get this in front of the camera. He marketed this, um, and this is basically a handle, a handle with a piece of, of steel. Let me get that in front of the. Yeah, hold it still. And, and you is, use that for shear scraping, right? For shear scraping, and it's got two ends. So you can turn you can turn going one way and then you can flip this around and you can you can go the other way. So um, works very well. Uh, you just touch it up and then what what he did he he had a, a small ceramic stone that what he would do is you know he'd sharpen it and just hit the edge with that ceramic stone and it gave a, a just a small burr to that and. Um, handle so you can make yourself a wooden handle for that too you don't have to have good. a metal handle and this is a quarter uh quarter thick inch wide about just a little less than six inches so i mean you could get a piece of this so this is polished this, i mean this was done up real nice but um I mean, so you, uh, you're going to use that on the outside of a bowl is that right correct and you're going to have it. What's its orientation on the tool rest? Well, it it works just just it, it's the same as you would normally do it, except you just instead of like using the side of a gouge, you've got this this full edge. Yeah, but so, you're, are you you're not laying it flat on the rest? Not flat, no. It was on at an angle. It's on at an angle, and set up a like that. You're, you're you're skimming the outside of the work with that. Correct, and then you can go. You can go. It's all according and according to what orientation you're in. You can go one way, and if you need to go the other way, you can just flip it around. Use the other side. Um, works that looks like a about a forty-five degree angle on that thing. Yeah. Um, Ray, I have a question. Sure. I've been noticing a lot of tools. Box masters a little same way. They're a lot shorter handled. What's the give with that? I always thought we want long handles. At least I thought I do. Uh, you know, uh, we, what happens is when you when you use when you use something like this. When I use this on the outside, I mean, obviously you can't do the inside. You use it on the outside. You take off so little. I mean, all you're doing this is a cleanup. And I think a lot of times what people do is they 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 think that they're going to muscle the wood into a finished whatever they want and it, they, they they don't learn a delicate touch this takes off the angel hair you hear you hear talk about you need angel hair that's what this does and the edge is long enough that you can you're all you're doing is touching in a very small point you can move down just you know you keep an eye where you bend last and you can you can use this whole edge 
But, but boy, if you got a catch of that at all, it's going to fly know, across the. Yeah, you're you're not you're not thinking about this right. The reason you get a catch is you're being <laughs> aggressive. This is finish work. No, no, no. The inadvertent swinging the chisel and catching the tip. Yeah, but inadvertent not... inadvertent is an accident. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> that's <it>. true. <laughs> This has nothing to do with, I mean, inadvertent could be a handle four feet long. So, you know, it's just, it's a yeah. light touch. You got to do a light touch because this is, this is that finish cut. And it, it takes off a whisker and uh, the, and the surface is so nice, but that was, a, uh, I, I, I got it from him. I thought it was his design. I'm not sure. It's not, I mean, it's not over the top design thing. He's got a handle and a, piece of steel like um, uh, we talked about earlier. So that's it. You, you can make one of those out of wood pretty easy too. Ray comments? mentioned Ray mentioned about the catch business. Uh, um, he's You're using that on the outside of your uh, vessels, aren't you, Ray, as opposed to the inside? Correct. So, so you're, 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 um, your banjo is right up against the wood. So even if it is a slight catch, there's there's no place for the tool to go. It's not like right. you're really hanging out over the edge of your, you're, you're not, your yeah. tool rest. Yeah, you you don't have any, you're not, there's no real big overhang. It's just basically, matter of fact, it, it's at a very, very steep angle to the work um, with a sheer cut. So, uh, I mean, if you take it now paying attention and, and tap it into the wood, you're gonna, you just destroyed the piece. But the idea is, is delicate, delicate, delicate. Yeah. Hey, Ray. Yeah. Well, so why would you use that instead of the side of a soft background gouge? That's what because, I always use for that. Because I have so much surface area to work with that when you put this up against how much you have to work with on the gouge, this is much more so I can, prep this whole edge and I could work anywhere along there and make the same cut. I'm also thinking it would be a lot easier to use that than the gouge. The gouge leads me to catch. I get a little bit of a bobble and I'm gone. But that's, that's not going to happen with that. Well, and what happens too is when I go to this, I go to this with a purpose that this is what I'm going to use. What happens, I, I find people turn with a gouge and they get in and go, okay, I'm going to make a shear cut and they make it with the same tool that they just did everything else with and the edge isn't prepped. So they're going in there and they're trying to do a finish cut and they don't bother putting an edge on it. So with this, this is this is sharpened, ready to go. And, um, and that's what it's used for, it's used for a finish cut. And it works good, uh, very good, as a matter of fact. Hi. Thank you very much, Ray. Is there another question there that I cut off? Yeah, uh, Ray, I, at the last Mid-Atlantic, I bought um, Phil Irons' triangular scraper on a handle. I tried that the other day and I said, eh, I don't see the value in it. It looks very, it would have a very similar cutting edge to this. It's a little bit concave though. It's not entirely straight. So I don't know. I'm I'm trying to figure out what the deal is with these special scrapers you have to bring that one in and show us we, we can't visualize it without looking at it yeah. okay hey by the okay. way John, your background is flipped i'm reading it backwards oh well i mean that <laughs> might be you because it's reading okay to me but if it's no <laughs> I don't it's, know. it's just you yeah okay no, I'll everybody when somebody else is talking just um, a quick uh just a quick comment. Uh, Ray started the uh, Lancaster area wood turners. We're grateful to him for that. That's true. 2009. How many years ago? How many years ago? 2009. Nine? Okay. 2009. 14 years ago. And Ray was president for about six years. So club owes Ray a lot. Thank you, John. Um, Roger, how about you? We haven't heard from you in a while. What do you got to show us? See if I can make my share screen work. I've just got a few things to show you guys. Uh, Mike, what do you have? Mike, peace. Okay, I was going to show my uh, shop made version of the same thing that uh, uh, that, that Ray showed. And, and this is based on watching Richard Raffin's movies recently, but it's a sheer scraper sharpened on one side. It's got a little bit of a profile to it. I, I may have to refine this a little bit, but 
Uh, this is about $11 bar of one inch by six inch high speed steel off of Amazon. Uh, you can find it by any of the links on any of my videos that get my Amazon affiliate links. And I put it in a in an old repurposed uh, Sorby handle that I didn't didn't like for thread chasers. Uh, and the ferrule is actually the outer ring of a uh, bearing came off my bandsaw that was seized. But you can make so many tools and play with them at, a, at a, such a modest price. I've got several of them here. Here's an example of a thin parting tool, one eighth uh, inch or three millimeter by, I think, 16 millimeter. I can't remember ex the exact width. It's a bit more than half inch. This is about $9. This is about uh, ten dollars. Uh, you're talking about straight up high speed steel, is that, that right? Right, and it's already been heat treated. Uh, so it's not O2 or M3 no, or no, it's high stuff. It's, it's M2, M2 steel. It's used in the uh, metal industry on as parting. To, most of this is used for parting tools for various machining operations. Here's an example of of a bar that I haven't dealt with yet, but it's, I was going to make a heavy bowl scraper, conventional scraper, after, again, after watching Rip, Richard poo-poo uh, in the negative rake, and I've converted a lot of my scrapers negative rake. But basically, uh, you mark it, and rather than grind it all away, you use a four-inch cheap Harbor Freight angle grinder with a metal wheel to, to cut the steel away for the tang and the tip, and then refine it on, on your grinder. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be grinding a long time. This eight millimeter is fairly thick. Um, but but the, the high speed steel is so cheap. I don't know why anybody would want to use some softer metal. Here's one that I made a recess tool for thread chasing. And so, so um, Mike, just on that question of high speed steel, not all high speed steels are made the same. And when I buy things off Amazon, I get oh, concerned about uh, the quality of the high speed steel. Are you having good luck with keeping an edge well you know i have not had any problem and i think that what you're referring to is an issue when you're buying cheap wood turning tools that haven't been properly heat treated like something from maybe a benjamin best with a quality control but because these this steel is used in in the in, in industrial settings it's it might be made in india might be made in china uh, but it's still M2 steel. I have not had any problems with any of the bars uh, that I've bought. Um, here's a heavy square edge scraper that I made. You know, the longer handle. <laughs> but this little short one that I'm using for the outside of bowls is shear scrape, which I just finished yesterday. Did a video on it, but it hadn't been published yet. It's got, you know, relatively short handle, less, no more than about seven inches. But all of this high-speed steel is just not all that expensive. Some vendors, it's funny how you'll get some variation in prices, but I found every every one of these bars, uh, and this is one of my favorite tools, this 8 millimeter by, by 8 millimeter uh, beading and parting tool. Most of them are 10 millimeter or 3 eighths of an inch. This is 5 sixteenths, which is, to me is just a perfect size for what I use it for, mostly tenons and, and such. But... There's not that huge variation in price on the different sizes. It's kind of, you kind of scratch your head and a piece that's twice, has twice as much steel in it may maybe only cost 20% more. Hey, Mike, uh, you claim that first, I, I, I didn't mean to sound derogatory, that first chisel you showed, you said it was negative rake. But no, it doesn't match my no, understanding. No, 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 none of these are negative rake. If I said that, oh. I, I spoke in error. I meant a shear scraper. Oh, did, I thought you said negative. Maybe you No, did. I'm getting away from negative rake. I'm going back to conventional. Uh, that first one I showed is a shear scraper, just kind of like the one that uh, the John Jordan one that Ray showed. Okay, I misunderstood <laughs> that. I was just going to say, how's that a negative rake? Okay. Mike, what's the included angle when that's ground? Uh, 45 degrees. So, Mike, uh, what's your I reasoning? Mean I mean of the bevel, 45 degrees? 45 degrees. Yeah. Rich, go Mike, ahead. Mike, why are you getting away from the negative rake and going back to the traditional scraping? Um, 
something to do, something to experiment with, but also uh, Richard Raffin is one of my heroes. I watch all of his videos, and, you know, I'm in a collaboration project with him, so it's like, you know, let's go back and, and, and try this uh, and, 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 and see, you know. It doesn't cost a whole lot to experiment. Richard has been a very helpful guy to all of, all of us over the years. We don't most most people probably don't know how much they owe Richard from his uh, very early books. There weren't any good books before Richard came along. Amen. Mine is some of mine are just absolutely almost thumb worn <laughs> <laughs> from using right. his references. Um, any other questions for Mike? If we move on to somebody else. Thanks a lot, Mike. I very good discussion. Roger, you want to try it again? Yeah, I'll try it again. Okay. Got it this time? Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Well, I tell you what, nothing really difficult about this turning, but uh, from my perspective, it's a beautiful piece of wood. It's oriental cherry that a guy gave me a while back. And at least from my perspective, I get as much enjoyment out of just ending up with a beautiful piece of wood as I do a very complex turning. So I thought you guys might like to see that, but nice piece of crotch. That's a beautiful piece. Really What's the bottom of it look like? You got another slide? I do not. Okay. <laughs> Any questions for Roger? Beautiful oh. job sanding. I always have problems with those, those kind of pieces, getting that sanded surface you know getting rid of all the tool marks that i inevitably get on those kind of pieces on that flat side yeah that one that one came out real good for me so this next piece uh, again nothing really fancy about the turning but this uh, french rolling pin with a celtic knot i had not done a celtic knot before so um and if you guys i'm sure a lot of you guys have turned one of these but uh, the key here is learning how to get the um, the cuts in the 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 blank before you start turning in it and uh, to have it come out. So this is a piece of walnut with maple, the Celtic knot that uh, my wife really likes. So that was a success. So that's another geometric thing I've had explained any number of times that I don't quite understand. <laughs> Got to try it to find out. So this next. Uh, photo is a label, and um, this was probably one of the most challenging projects I've ever dealt with. And obviously, just by looking at it, you can tell there wasn't a ton of turning, but a lot of carving. So this um, was done primarily with uh, my sanding, a mini carver I've got, a Dremel tool, but uh, that is hard maple. Uh, so it was uh, it was a challenge to work with, but it really did come out per doggone well. It's about 13 and a half inches long, and uh, the down there at the cup is probably about three and a half, maybe or so inches uh, in diameter. So, are you anyway. using that in the kitchen? No, she's got it on display in the kitchen. So she's not <laughs> using it at this point. She probably will at some point, but right now. She just wants to display it. So, so what's the finish? Uh, this I put um, a um, food safe oil on it. I forget who makes that food safe oil. I just get it at the big box stores, but um, just a food safe oil. Okay. Nice piece. What part did you turn of of the little? <clears throat> I started this piece right down here, the cup, and then went, you know, just got started, and then I had to do the rest of it by hand. So, again, very little turning on it. Most of it was carving. Okay. And then, what else you got? Okay. Then, uh, Barry has mentioned it at uh, the meeting a few times about the need for some additional uh, wig stands. So, um, I introduced this idea to our club in, in uh, February at our February meeting and in March meeting, that first meeting after was introduced, we had guys bring in 59 wig stands. So I was very pleased with that. So um, there's just a, a photo of a few of them that we finished strictly with polyurethane. 
and we uh, have partnered with a high school uh, to do painting. And the, this is a group of them that I picked up from the students, but we have had tremendous feedback on this project. And we are actually teaming with an organization in Evansville called Chemo Buddies. And uh, what they do is they provide uh, wigs to cancer patients experiencing hair loss at no charge. And now they are also getting a no charge a week stand to go with that wig. So very nice uh, service for the community and uh, we've had very good feedback. So the, the students at the school, I was over there last week. They asked me to come over and meet some of the students. Those students get what they have done. They really, it really soaked in that what they're doing with their painting is uh, having a positive impact on people that are going through a difficult time in their life. So uh, it's been beneficial from a number of different perspectives. So is that just is that acrylic paint they're using? Did you specify the paint or what's up? I did not specify the time of paint, but I think it is acrylic paint. And, and then they they it? after it's painted, then they put polyurethane on. Okay, right. That's a wonderful addition to the wig stand project. Those are those are marvelous. I'm just I'm blown away. So, anyway, guys, that's all I've got. Thank you. Hey, questions for Roger. Roger, the idea of adding the uh, kids for painting, great idea, and the results are phenomenal. I'm sure yeah, it brings actually, a lot of joy to people. Yeah, actually, uh, there was an article in their local paper yesterday, and they quoted in that article a couple of kids' uh, comments that they had and talked about uh, the impact this had on them personally because they have relatives that have gone through this. So it meant a lot to them to be able to do this. Matter of fact, while I was there last uh, Thursday, um, the kids asked if they could sign the ones they painted. So absolutely they could. And then one student asked, would it be okay if I write a, a, a note of inspiration uh, for whoever receives this? And she did. So that's pretty neat that the, those kids of, really, really get what they're doing. Did any of the kids come back to you and ask to learn how to turn? No, not at this point anyway. So Roger, I think that's a wonderful Roger, development for the you. My, my daughter's an art teacher at school, and I, I will immediately talk with her to at dinner tonight about this. It's a great idea and gives the kids a real uh, positive outlook. Thank you. That's a good idea. Matter of fact, I had read in, uh, I think, the American Wood Turner about Central Illinois Club that's been doing this for a number of years. And I communicated with one of the guys up there. And and uh, at that time, they were partnering with three different schools to paint them. Matter of fact, I think they'd been at it for about five years and they were about to turn their 5,000th wig stand. So, um, and when I, when I introduced this to the club in February, I told them about what I had found out about the Central Illinois Club and partnering with uh, three high schools. And one of our club members has a daughter that is the art teacher at this high school. So they are the ones that stepped up, the daughter of one of our club members. So it's been really good. Thank you very much, Roger. That's great. Um, another guy we haven't heard for a while here is John Chalikian. What do you have today, John? Hi, Ch um, I really don't have anything to show. I have a question. Uh, I was turning a, a piece of uh, pine uh, for a neighbor. I got some wood from them. They had a tree taken down. And uh, so I finished up, you know, I, I started between centers, put a, um, a spigot on the end, and I finished up the outside. And then when I turned it around and put the uh, mounted it in my chuck, then uh, it's running off center. And I'm just wondering if I'm doing something wrong or if this is pretty typical that when you um, put a spigot on and then you reverse it, that you have to kind of recut it and true it up again. So that's my mm -hmm. question really to, the, to folks for a discussion. Am I doing something wrong? Is my lathe off or 
or what. I mean, it's not ex off a ton, but it is off something that, you know, you put uh, a tool on and it's riding up and down instead of riding smooth. One thing you can check is uh, check the alignment of your tailstock <clears throat> to your headstock because that's not unusual. If it's out a little bit, you cut a, a, a tendon. The tendon will be on the center of what you're actually turning at that point. And then when you switch it around, now you're not using a tailstock anymore and it will be out. But check the alignment of your uh, tailstock to your headstock and uh, there's nothing you can really do about it. Okay. Thank you. I, I also think uh, it might have to do with the soft pine wood when the chuck squeezes down on it it's going to distort a little bit because of the the soft side and the hard side of the wood right right don i blame when i have that happen when i i blame my uh chucks that maybe they're not sturdy enough or not strong enough or not made well enough that's my excuse so no, I the, the chucks are generally you know, pretty well, pretty uh, pretty accurate. But if your tail stalks out even a couple of thousandths of an inch, and you're out there six inches, uh, by the time you spin that around, it will the end of the wood will be out a little bit, and you have to straighten it up. I mean that that happens every time you go back into chuck. Rich Goldman, what were you going to say? You know, chucks are are notorious, but they're known to not be exact when you're clamping down on something anyway so even if you pulled it out and rotated it in 90 degrees it would be different and that's why if you really wanted this to be exactly the way you did it you're going to have to go with some kind of a collet uh, to hold it some kind of a collet chuck um it's just the four-way chucks are not that accurate to do to, to kind of have to retune the, the surface when you flip it around Okay, so it's a pretty common thing that it's going to be out a little bit, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You did, you did uh, say you were working with pine, right? Yeah, on this particular. That one's going to squeeze down differently, like somebody else pointed out. So the softer your wood, the more you're going to have that problem, I'm guessing. The other yeah. thing, John, is that if you've taken something out of the chuck, before you take it out, mark the number one position. So that when you do put it back, you put it back in exactly the same place as you took it out. All right. If you take it a few degrees off where your chuck has bitten into the wood and you move it, that could just twist it enough to throw it off as well. Yeah, plus when you mark that position, it, 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 the chuck jaws will make an indentation in the tenon. That's right. And you get the chuck jaws back into that same indentation. You get, you're closer that way. Yeah, you get it much closer to being you know, perfect as you'll ever get it. Right. If, if I'm going to rechuck something, I, I I do mark, you know, what uh, jaw, you know, the thing is lined up in. But this this is when I'm just starting between centers. Yeah, it's uh, reversing. What I'm talking about. But yeah. yeah, I get a lot of good points. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Doug, what do you have today? I just wanted to follow up on the discussion about the cancer patients. Um, I was recently started making some pens out of um, burl wood um, for, um, again, I've been with part of a writer's group as a, a cancer survivor myself. I never lost my hair or anything like that after treatment, but there's a bunch of people that don't use wigs that still have cancer. And I took those, um, uh, those pens around to the chaplain at the, Barshinger Center here in Lancaster is a cancer center uh, to give out to pa patients just to remind people that even though something, uh, even though um, cancer, or should, let me put it this way, a burl looks really ugly on a tree and yet it's very beautiful inside. So the, the philosophy is that something beautiful can come out of a, of, of a cancer, which is a burl, t a burl is a form of tumor on the tree, whether it's you know, whether it's um, totally kills the patient or not is a different question, but it is a, a form. So anyway, that's just an alternative if people are looking for something else that's not necessarily wig stands in the cancer uh, that I found was quite well received so far. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Doug. Um, Duxbury, you can send me a, um, a chat. You got something you wanted to show us right now? 
Yeah. Yeah, I've got the check frame. Yeah. Um, you spotlight me. This is the frame. This is the mandrel. It's a check frame. This is a sorby type of thing. It's got a tenon on the back. You grab it in the chuck. And you can do all kinds of things with this. But it wrote it, it to get your offset, it's camming around an offset circle. It's not intuitive what you're doing. This, this thing, you, on a one-way talent chuck with number two jaws, you take Lift the- it up a bit. Lift you, it up so we can see it all. Okay, now hold it still. Hold still and talk. Gotcha. <laughs> you I get excited. You take jaws one and three out and leave two and four, and that grabs onto here and pinches this mandrel that fits into here. This is a stop. When I make this, I make this whole frame, no hole in here, and put the stop on it, line it up, and clamp it. This is before I cut this, and then drill it. So this is dead center on the chuck. And this is a stop. Now to get the offset, you slide this back and forth. It gives you, an, it's intuitive. You, you know exactly what the offset is. In fact, to get the uh, exact offset, I put a drill bit in between here. So if I want 3 16 I lay a 3 16 drill bit in here, and I got a 3 16 offset. The mandrel goes in the, this hole. This is an inch and 5 eighths. I made the I made this inch and five eighths because the number two jaws go from an inch and a half to two and seven eighths. So if I ever want to take this out, I can put this back into a chuck and return it. But that fits in here like that. And then once you've got this offset, like I say, it's intuitive. You can turn this and make the design go anywhere you want on this piece. You glue the workpiece to the mandrel, right? Two-sided tape, yeah. Yeah. Or if you want to make if you want to make a bowl, like this is a bowl, three center bowl, you just turn you just need more hands. You, you leave a tenon on there, inch and five eighths, and you can put this in the chuck and slide this anywhere you want. And index it anywhere you want, and turn anything you want on it. Okay. So, like like this piece here, I put an inch and five eighths chuck or tenon on here, stick that in the chuck, then I can get an offset. This is a three quarter inch offset, and it can be indexed in any position I want. This is this is a four, this is four centers on here which is kind of hard to see. This is eight centers on here. So it kind of evolves all, all, all the way around. And do this- you do, video, do you do videos, Jim? If you do, you need to do a video of this. This is just too much fun. You got it. You got it. I, I tell you, I spent, you wouldn't believe what I've done with this thing. Anyway, this, this, is, this is parallel turned like a crankshaft. The same thing turned between centers with eight centers out here and one center here. Now, instead of turning around like this, it's turning around like this. Uh -huh. yeah. You've got a big center, a big turning up here and smaller turnings out here. This is an eight center turning on one axis on this end and eight axes is on this end. My next one, I'll do eight. I'll do four axes on this end. Then I'll switch this to one, and I'll do four on this end. So I, I can turn four down to here and expand out of there. So it would taper down and back up. I've had all kind of fun with this. Um, Fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop because it's 11 o'clock, and Stu has something he really wants to show us. And I'm going to oh, give Stu oh. 
Oh, very good. Just a quick note. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, last week, we lost one of our members that's been with us for a long time and due to a, a serious illness in the lungs. And anyway, uh, he passed last week and between Bert and I, we collaborated a, a, uh, an urn for him. And I'd just like to quickly try and show that. What's the fellow's name, please? It was uh, Wayne Lee. And you probably don't know him. I don't think he was ever a uh, a uh, member of this group. But anyway, he uh, he passed last week, and we made a. Wayne was one of the founding members of the Edmonton Woodturners Guild. You see that? Wayne Lee. Okay. Yes, that's the urn. That's an urn. You guys are great. That's a fishing reel. You guys, you, you guys are fantastic. Yeah, we had a we had a good time making that too. We were we were pretty excited about it. His wife is just thrilled with it. We, I actually made two. I made another small one for his for his daughter because she wants to take some ashes back to back to uh, uh, to New Brunswick. So I made a small one. I see you have lures on the end of it. Yeah. I'm sorry? You have lures on the end of your stand, right? I stuck a I stuck a, a hook on there and and um, here's the little one. So it's a black walnut base and a few rocks glued on here. The um, the body of the of the reel is this one is is birch. Can't see it. Sharon didn't make it, Stu. Didn't uh, make it. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna pull the plug on you because we're over the hour. Yeah, I know. Um, okay. So people we are clicking off. Thanks, yeah, I, I did want to give you a minute to talk about Wayne Lee and show the show the fishing reel. And on that note, uh, we'll see you all next week. Good. Thanks, John. Yeah. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you, John. Take care, John. Another good morning. Wood shock.